Good evening. Good evening. Trust everyone to have a good afternoon. Uh, we had a good visit with our sister Hazel. We got to sing with her, and she enjoyed that immensely. As was announced in the messenger, we're going to be looking at the, the Lord's Church, the establishment of the Lord's Church, the falling away of the Lord's Church, and then the restoration of the Lord's Church. Now, I will not cover all of this material at one time. Tonight, I would like for us together to look at the establishment of the Lord's Church. Most of us, if most of us probably are familiar with Matthew chapter 16, beginning with about verse 13. We're going to let that be our launching point tonight for our lesson, and we'll be going to some other passages, so I hope you have your Bibles and your notebook to follow along. There's a lot of confusion about the Lord's church as to what it is, uh, when it started, and how, how it should be, how a person uh, has membership in the church. What is the, the Lord's church compared to, say, other churches? The only way to get the answer to this is turn to the scriptures and let the Lord teach. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. We see that Jesus came into the parts of the regions of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? That's very critical answer to this question. And this, so they said, Well, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Obviously, he sounded like one of these prophets or thought maybe he was one of these prophets come back from the dead. At this point, all these people that they've mentioned have passed away. But then this is the question to the masses. Then he turns to his disciples and he says, what do, who do you say that I am? And Peter, giving that wonderful answer in verse 16, he answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Upon that confession, Jesus made a pronounced a blessing on Peter when he said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, or son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Just a moment here, how did the Father reveal this to Peter? It was not some kind of secret, special way. Peter was able to observe by the things that Jesus said, the things that Jesus did, and, and the things that he taught, that he was the son of God. He looked at his miracles, he heard his words, and he had put all this information together, the Father revealing this as Jesus submitting to the Father's will. But then because of this confession, Jesus said to, to him in verse 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. But notice verse 19, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. That's the way the New American Standard reads. Now, I want you to think for just a moment about what Jesus has asked. Who am I? Who do people say I am? We know that the masses were confused. It was important to Jesus that his disciples understand who he was because he said, when after this confession, on this rock, what rock? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Obviously, the rock that he's talking about is the solid rock fact that he is the Son of God. The word rock is in the feminine form in the Greek. Peter's in the masculine. The church is not built on Peter. It was built on the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. Now, I want you to think for just a moment about something else that he said. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. These are our two primary points tonight to look at. But let's look at the prophecy of the kingdom. Turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. Eric, this is a very interesting chapter where Daniel has been taken captive by the king of Babylon by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream. I'm not sure by reading the text if Nebuchadnezzar remembered the dream or if he was testing those magicians, those enchanters, 
those wise men, those Chaldeans uh, among his Babylonian people. But the challenge was he, he had a dream and he wanted these men who were not of God, of course, to tell him both his dream and what the dream meant. Well, of course, if they couldn't do that, he said, you'll be put to death. And, and these, these magicians, these wise men, these Chaldeans said, well, listen, uh, you tell us the dream, we'll tell you what it meant. Well, he didn't tell them what the dream was, and, and, they, and they said, well, nobody can tell you what you dream. Uh, nobody, nobody on earth could do that. But finally, young man Daniel was summoned and stood before the king. And I know I'm abbreviating this, but you go back and read all the text for yourself. And Daniel is summoned to come and speak for the king. And he's brought before, before Nebuchadnezzar. And, and so there's an urgency here to get the answers to this. Let me tell you, God sent this dream to Nebuchadnezzar. God wanted the pagans to know something about the future, but he had to have help from one of his own prophets, Daniel, to, to, prophes to answer and give him the dream and interpretation of it. And so Daniel went to his house, verse 17, and he made a decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. In other words, he was protecting all these young men. And so we see in verse 19, when the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision, so Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And so Daniel answered, and he said, Blessed be the name of God, verse 20, forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. He's praying, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You've given me wisdom and might, and now have made known to me what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. So Daniel goes and he stands before Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's had this dream, and he doesn't, he may have remembered some of it. It's not clear if, how much he remembered. If any, he told the, the wise men and the Chaldeans he did, that it had been that he'd gone from him. Nonetheless, there's only one individual or one person who could tell him what he dreamed. And it wasn't Daniel, it was God through Daniel. And so God reveals to Daniel this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had dreamt. And he also will tell him the meaning of the dream. And, and so he tells him, beginning with, we we'll come down here to uh, verse 27, that Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. They can't give you the answer. I want you to notice what Daniel says in verse 28. But there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Just note that. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be, watch this, in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. Verse 29, as for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while you were while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets, that is God, has made, made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than any other living. But for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. O king, you were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold. Its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image and its feet 
of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now I've imagined Nebuchadnezzar's in, in awe at this point. He says, now I'm going to tell you what it means. I'll tell you the interpretation. Verse 36. O king, you, O king, you're a king of kings. You know, the Babylonians at that point ruled the world. They were a powerful kingdom physically, very weak spiritually. You are king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and honor, and glory. Listen, that man was where he was because God put him there. I don't know what that did to the mind of Nebuchadnezzar, but that's the way it was. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them. All you are the head of gold. And he goes on to, to explain that after you, another king will rise that, that's, that's inferior, but it's as, it's as strong as iron, and as much as iron uh, that's inferior, verse 39, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, and as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet, the toes, partly of potter's clay, and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it. Just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, and the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, and they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, now I want to pause here. There's a lot in this text that we cannot dig into detail-wise. But there were kingdoms. You had the Babylonian kingdom. Then you had the Medo-Persian Empire that followed the Babylonian kingdom. Then you have the Macedonian or the Grecian kingdom. Uh, Philip of Macedon was the ruler of that. And then you have the Roman Empire, which began and was the final of the four kingdoms. And then you have the kingdom of God coming into this. Now watch this. He already told him, I'm showing you something that's going to come to pass in the latter days. What was happening then was not necessarily of significance. What would happen with the kingdom that came after that uh, was not of any significance. What The other kingdoms, little significance. He's just giving a brief historic account of a kingdom that would take over a kingdom, take over a kingdom. And finally, verse 44, in the days of these kings, what kings? The Roman kings, the rulers during the Roman age. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall what? Never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. And that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will happen, come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Fast forward, the Roman Empire. And about 400 years after the Old Testament closes, we have a man by the name of John the Baptist who comes preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He was, the, he was the forerunner of Jesus. He was the introducer of Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, God, through Daniel, told Nebuchadnezzar about a kingdom that would come into existence during the latter days. John is preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
if you if you have, uh, for example, one of your uh, friends is getting married, or or maybe someone you know is expecting a child, and, and we would we don't use this language, but let's say that we did. Well, and it's going to be say within the next year or so, a couple. Of years. But it's not. It won't be long. It's at hand. It's nearby. Or you know someone's going to have a baby. Yep, it's going to be with it. Well, they, they just found out it'll be about it'll be about eight months. They just found out that they're expecting that that baby's time is at hand. That's the way they used that expression. It was something nearby. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew chapter four, verse seventeen: "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." Now we have friends who believe that Daniel 2.44 has not yet been fulfilled. Jesus told Peter in his conversation in Matthew 16 and verse 19, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that interesting? Who's he talking to? Peter and the other apostles? And we'll come back to the fulfillment of that statement in just a few minutes. But now... John says the kingdom is at hand. The Lord Jesus said during his lifetime, the kingdom was at hand. In, in, uh, in Mark 9 and verse 1, in one of that abbreviated gospel, Jesus said there's some standing here, right where? Right there in his very presence, who shall in no way taste of death until they see the kingdom present or come with now, Daniel prophesied the kingdom that come, would come in the latter days. And let me tell you something about that kingdom. John called it the kingdom of heaven. Jesus called it the kingdom of heaven. This kingdom that God will establish will stand forever. It will not be left to another people. It will break, break to pieces all these kingdoms. And here comes John preaching it. Here comes Jesus preaching it. Jesus said, there are people standing right here in my presence who will in no way taste the death until they see the kingdom come or the kingdom present with power. Now, either the kingdom came during the lifetime of some of those people, or there's some mighty old folks living today, or Jesus was wrong. Well, we know Jesus wasn't wrong. We know that he was full of grace and truth. He was the way, the truth life. You shall know the truth, John 8, 32. Jesus told the truth. Now, what about the lifetime of these people? Would they see the kingdom come or see it present with power? Now, follow this, this line here for just a moment. Turn over to Luke chapter 24. Jesus has already died. He has already been buried. He's already been resurrected. He has already spent the 40 days with the apostles that he was going to spend with them, and he's giving them some final words in Luke 24, beginning with verse 44. He's talking to them in his resurrected body. He says, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, looking back during his ministry, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and the prophets and the psalms concerning me. I'm fulfilling these things. He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you're all witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you that tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now what did Jesus say in Mark 9 1? There's some standing here who are present right now who will not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God present or come with power. Here Jesus said, let me tell you, I want you to go and wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now let me just ask you, 
If you didn't know anything about what I've just said, but it's the first time you've ever heard it, does it make sense that Daniel prophesied of a kingdom that would come in the latter days? If you follow the kingdoms with, beginning with Babylon, coming all the way down to Rome, does it make sense that the kingdom that Daniel was talking about would come about during the time of the reign of the Romans? Well, of course it did. Why? John said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said there's some standing here who will see the kingdom come with power. And before you die, you won't even taste of death. And Jesus said, I want you apostles to go wait in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now turn over to Acts, the book of Acts. We're not here to dig into the, the details, but we, we have to begin with, when you go back and review chapter 1, you have the apostles praying. Judas has been replaced by Matthias. There's 12 again now. And they're all praying. And they've gone to Jerusalem just like Jesus said. And we see that in verse 17, that Matthias was numbered with the apostles and to take a part in, in this ministry. And, and so you, you have this man chosen to take Judas's place. Matthias, verse 26, Matthew 1. And then we see the day of Pentecost when it had fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. Who? The apostles. What are they doing? Praying. What are they waiting for? They're waiting for power to come to them from on high. Where are they? Why, they're in Jerusalem. Where did Jesus tell them to wait? In Jerusalem. Where are they? They're in Jerusalem. What's happening here? It's the day of Pentecost. It has fully come, and it says they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided or cloven tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each other. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, you have Jews from all over the world. You have all these nations listed here. This is a fulfillment of what was spoken by the prophet Joel, as you continue reading down here in verse 16 from Joel chapter 2. And so this is another fulfillment of prophecy. But now, we have to follow this line of reasoning. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. It will not be left to another people. And it will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It's coming in the latter days. John said, listen, you need to repent. The kingdom of heaven, of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3, 2. Jesus said, listen, you need to repent. The kingdom of heaven is nearby, Matthew 4 and verse 17. There are some who are listening to my very voice who will not die until they see the kingdom come or present with power, Mark 9, 1. What's going on here? You have the apostles waiting in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit has come down and sat upon each of them, and they spoke with, with tongues they never studied, and these people understood the message, and they began to speak as the Spirit gave them utterance. And, and so we see that the people were, were, were just amazed and, and because of verse 7. It said, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? Listen, that wasn't them speaking. That was God. That was the Holy Spirit speaking through these men. How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And in the language, the nations are, are, are all listed here. And, of course, we know how it plays out if we've studied Acts chapter 2. And so finally, by the time Peter gets through with his sermon, he's convicted them of murdering the Son of God. Now, we've skipped a lot by going from here to here. But that's what's taking place here. And God showed them that these men, listen, these tongues they spoke were not unintelligible. They were languages that people understood from the language they grew up hearing, the language in which we were born. Now, let's back up and look at a couple of other examples that I know you know. But you look at your parallel passages to Luke chapter 24. 
And you look at Matthew 28, verses 18 and following. Jesus said, All authority, all power has been given me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples or teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's Matthew's account of the Great Commission. When you go to Mark's account, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Who does not believe will be condemned. Now, those were the accounts from Matthew and uh, Mark. But you go back to Luke, and I want you to notice something before we move too quickly. Jesus said in verse 47 of Luke 24, that, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And so you have, you have the... The, the prophecy here of, of the of to be what to be preached. Now what did Peter say? Well these men are all upset in Acts chapter 2 and, and they in verse 37 it says they were pricked or cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do? You notice what Peter says and how it parallels with Luke 24 47 repent let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Isn't that an interesting parallel? What did Jesus tell them to preach? Repentance and remission of sin. What did they preach? Repentance and remission of sin. Why? Jesus said to them. Now, watch this. You know this. You're familiar with it. But maybe some uh, are, are not as familiar or maybe have forgotten. But you see that when, when they heard this, that, that about uh, 3,000, verse 41, were baptized. They gladly received these words and they were baptized. And about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now, you keep reading and you see in verse 47, once these people had, had, had been baptized for remission of sins, they, they were enjoying one another's company and they were having favor with praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now the word church is not in your better manuscript, but we know that's what he's talking about. We know it's also talking about the kingdom. Turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Now you got a parallel here and we're going to move now to... to to a little more study in the kingdom, a little, a little more at the church, and see some parallels. But um, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. What did you say, Paul? He's delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Now, in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, they were added to the church daily. Those who were being saved. Now let's go back to the discussion between Jesus and the apostles. And it's primarily, specifically rather, the discussion between Jesus and Peter. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Jesus died, but he didn't stay dead. He came forth from the grave victorious over death, the grave, and now sits at the right hand of God. And uh, according to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14, 14 verse 17 rather, Jesus is now Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Hmm. What's he the king over? Let's see. If you have a king, then you must have a kingdom. The kingdom was promised by Daniel. It was preached by John. It was preached by Jesus more than once. And the Lord added or <coughs> added those or translated people out of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. 
I'll get it right in a minute. It's Revelation 17, 14. He is now Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You can't have a kingdom without a king, and you can't have a king without a kingdom. The kingdom came into existence during the lifetime of the people, some of the people that Jesus preached to. Yes, some of them died, died but not all. The apostles lived long enough, except for Judas, who betrayed him, to see the kingdom come into existence. Do you remember what Jesus said to Peter? Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. What does a key do? Well, it either locks or it unlocks. It's powerful. And, and, and so go back and look at the statement that Jesus made to Peter in verse 19. And whatever you bind on earth, literally, will have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, Literally, will already be already be loosed in heaven. What did Jesus do? I mean, Peter do rather on Pentecost. He stood up and preached by what power? His own or the Holy Spirit? By the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And so, what was the answer when those people asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent. There's a key. Did Jesus teach repentance? I believe he did. Did John preach repentance? I believe he did. Matthew 3, 2. Matthew 4, 17. Luke 13, 3 and 5. That Jesus preached repentance. What did you say to Jesus in, in uh, Luke's gospel? That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. He preached repentance. Repentance was a key. What about baptism? Well, that's a key also. You see, Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. 3,000 people, Acts 2, 41, were baptized when they gladly received the word that they heard. And what did the Lord do with those who did that? He added them to the church. But he also translated them into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 2. 13. Now let's talk for a moment about the church. Some people believe that the church was an afterthought in the mind of God and that because he, Jesus couldn't establish his kingdom. We've already looked at scripture to show that he did establish his kingdom. It's not coming in the future. It's here. If you were baptized into Christ, the Lord translated you into his kingdom. Now how do you get into the church? Well, I believe it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, about verse 13, that by one spirit were you all baptized into one body. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, if the Lord, if the Lord added the saved to the church, how'd they get into the body? Oh, they responded to what Peter preached in Acts chapter 2 in verse 38, what Jesus said. In Mark 16 and verse 16, you believe and is baptized, will be saved. The Lord added the saved to the church daily. And so a person gets into the church and the kingdom the same way. What do you mean the spirit? By one spirit, we all baptized into one body. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus in Luke in John chapter 3, uh, verse 3, he said, um, I say to you, unless you, unless you're born again, Nicodemus, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Why are you talking to Nicodemus about the kingdom? Jesus is not coming yet. Oh yes, it is. John preached it, and I preached it. And Nicodemus heard. He's not introducing any new idea totally to him. Unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. Well, how did he get into the kingdom, Jesus? He said in verse five of John chapter three. I say to you, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, water baptism is the means by which one has their sins washed away, by which one comes into the kingdom. Because the, you know, think about this briefly. People say, well, that, that, that's Holy Spirit baptism. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, I want you to go and, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them. Who would do the baptizing? Jesus and the apostles. I want you to go make disciples and baptize them. That's not Holy Spirit baptism. 
That's baptism in water for remission of sins. Just like Philip and the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. They went down in the water and Philip baptized him. You must be born of water and the spirit, Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom. We've seen its prophecy. We've seen its fulfillment. We've seen its means of entrance. And now I want to talk about the church. Turn with me to, in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. I know we've been studying this on Sunday mornings, but I want us to see it again. And, and maybe something that you didn't catch when we went through it. In chapter 3, Paul talks about how by revelation he had made known to him the mystery, as, he, as he'd already briefly written, verse 3, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And he goes on to talk about how the, the gospel the mystery was not, not made known in other ages, but now it's been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. What is that body? Turn, turn back over to chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And he put him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all the sins of Who's the head of the church? It's not some fellow in Rome. It's not some group of men that decide they're going to start a church without looking at the Bible to see what it is. Jesus is the head of the church. And the church started on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 in about A.D. 33. Jesus is the head of it. As a matter of fact, verse, 20, verse 19 of Ephesians 2 says that the church is made up of a household of saints and members of a household of of God. It's God's family. But now, what about the church and God's plan for the church? It, was it not an afterthought in the mind of God? Because Jesus came to establish his kingdom and he couldn't do it. First of all, he did establish his kingdom. Now, Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. On the solid rock fact that I'm the son of God, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about two different institutions. It's just two different words to describe the same people. Watch this. Come down here to verse 8 of Ephesians 3. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Watch this. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now, wait a minute, Paul, this mystery, what is it? Well, it's the gospel, and it's been revealed now, but, it, but, but at the beginning of the ages, it was hidden. Now watch this, to the intent that now the manifold, that is the many-sided, the variegated wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers and heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. An eternal purpose. Now the eternal purpose was that the gospel would be revealed during this time. You want to know what that stone was that was cut from the mountain and and hit that great image in its feet. It was the gospel of Christ because Jesus was who Peter said that he was. And the gospel produces what? The church and the kingdom. The kingdom of God is more powerful than Babylonia. The kingdom of God is more powerful than the Medo-Persian Empire. The kingdom of God is more powerful than the Macedonian King Empire and the Roman Empire. And I ask you a question, where are those empires now? You go back and read Daniel's prophecy, it was prophesied they would cease to exist. But not God's kingdom. It will stand for how long? Forever. Why? Because its king is eternal. And the church was in the mind of God from before time eternal. Because you can't have an eternal purpose for the church preaching the gospel if the church wasn't eternally settled in the mind of God as, as well. Look at the logic. Somebody says, well, the, the church was an afterthought. No, it wasn't. It's part of God's eternal purpose. And where did he accomplish it? Paul said, in Christ Jesus. Now let's go back briefly. Um, 
Who men say that I am? Well, some say here, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, what was prophets? Who do you say that I am? That was a critical question. Peter said a lot of things he shouldn't have said. But he got this one right, didn't he? You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. By the way, that was a part of God's eternal purpose as well because you can't have a gospel and you can't have an eternal church without having an eternal Lord. Think about it. Now, Jesus built his church and it started in, on Pentecost just like he said that it would when, 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 when that, those men were endued with power from on high. And you know how people get into the Lord's church today? The same way that those Pentecostals did in Acts chapter 2. They had to hear the gospel. That it was to be preached. They had to understand that Jesus was the Son of God and they made a grave error in killing him. He was who? That he said that he was. And when they realized it, they were cut to the heart. Now, it amazes me if the people who will stand up and teach some kind of prayer that you pray to become a Christian, when the first gospel sermon didn't do anything like that. What do you need to do because of your sin? You need to repent. Who said so? God did. I like what one preacher said about Peter's sermon. He said, that wasn't Peter's sermon. That's God's sermon. Peter just got his mouthpiece. The Holy Spirit moved him to say what he did. Listen. We better not argue with God. Why do denominational preachers teach that the kingdom is in the future? Because they've been misled and they haven't studied the Bible. Why do denominational preachers and people believe that the church was an afterthought in the mind of God? They've not studied the scriptures. The Bible's clear. That does exist. Why is there confusion about so many churches? Same reason. You turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 4, and you say, how many bodies are there? One body. One body. Who's the head of that? What is that body? Well, it's the church. Chapter 1, verse 23. Who's the head of it? Jesus. What about it? The government. Well, you read Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, that elders were appointed in every church. Plural. Elders. Qualifications are given in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 for elders to be shepherds over God's people. How do God's people worship in spirit and in truth? John chapter 4 and verse 24. What do they do as they worship in spirit and truth? Can, can we come back and look at the New Testament and see how the early church had membership? Yes, we can. How can we see about its leadership? Go read the New Testament. How do you worship in the church in spirit and in truth? Who said so? Jesus. Now, in spirit and truth, now, now where do you find the, I know the spirit, the attitudes, where do you find the, the truth? Well, it's like one person said, well, God just gives us all these talents and we do whatever we want to. No, 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 that's not scriptural. You worship God falsely and you'll lose your soul. So will I. You refuse to obey the gospel, you're still lost. You refuse to be baptized, you're still lost. You refuse to worship God in spirit and truth, you're disobeying God. So am I. So what did they do? Well, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, they came up together on the first day of the week to break bread. Obviously an allusion to the Lord's Supper. And then 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, they, they gave of their means on the first day of every week in the American Standard Version. And they sang. Ephesians 5, verses 18 and 19. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dis 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 dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Colossians 3, 16, that you teach. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Pause quickly. Wait a minute. Be filled with the Spirit. Yeah, yes, that's Ephesians 5, 19. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Oh, that's the same thing. The Spirit speaks through the word. What do you do? Sing. Make melody in your heart to the Lord. What about a piano? Well, first of all, piano didn't exist in the first century. But there's nothing else said except to sing. 
and you want to stop the division in Christendom, just do what God said. Just If you just do what God said, we wouldn't have all this division, all this confusion. You know what's caused confusion? People don't study the Bible. They do what they want to do. But I want you to think about this as we bring this lesson to a close. Daniel, by God and the Holy Spirit, said in these last days, God is going to set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. You know, if you're in the kingdom and you're faithful in the kingdom, you're heaven bound. One more text, and the lesson is yours tonight. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one his own order. Christ the first fruits, according to those who are Christ that is coming, then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father, where he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all the enemies under his feet. Question. Is the kingdom in existence? Of course it is. Is Jesus now the king of it? Yes. Revelation 17, 14, he's the king. As a matter of fact, he told Pilate that he was. And of course he died as king of the Jews. And Pilate said, look, the Jews fought him over it. Said, look, what I've written, I've written. I'm sure God was behind that. But what's going to happen? When the resurrection occurs, the kingdom will be delivered to God. It's not coming in the future. It's here. And you know, if you're a faithful member of the kingdom, Jesus is going to, to take that kingdom and he's going to give it to the Father. I'll tell you what, that's what it means that it will stand forever. You can't destroy God's kingdom. Next week we're going to look at falling away, and then, then if time permits, we'll look at the restoration. We may take two lessons for that. I know I've covered a lot tonight. If there's any scripture you missed, uh, please see me afterward. I hope this is going to help you and enlighten I love the Lord. I love his word. I'm so thankful that I'm in his kingdom, that I'm in his church. Well, you see, the Bible says in Acts 20, verse 28, that he purchased the church with his own blood. That makes the church pretty special, doesn't it? It really does. And it's purchased by the most precious individual to ever grace this earth, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you need him in any way tonight? If so, please come as we stand and as we sing. God is holy.